really were letters that were written. They were written, many of them, of what we call epistles. Sunday school teacher asked her class one day, said, do you know what an epistle is? The little boy raised his hand and said, that's an apostle's wife. <laughs> that's not what it is. It's a letter. And he's writing letters to encourage them. God gives you the gift of pen. You should use the gift of your pen to write cards and notes and be an encouragement. And, and Paul had found them, not that he had found them, but through his ministry, these churches had started. The church of Ephesus grew to over 100,000 members and uh, grew mightily under the hand of Paul in the ministry. He was the evangelist, the apostle that would go in and preach the gospel. People would be saved. And during that time was a time of great idolatry. They had the idols for everything. You remember when he went to Mars Hill? He said, I even saw, I saw a God to an unknown God. They'd made an idol to an unknown God just in case they'd forgotten someone. It's kind of like, uh, I hate to use this, but has anyone ever been sued? If you've ever gotten lawsuit papers, on that lawsuit paper, it will say et al. And it will name unknown. Unknown people. Unknown defendants. Sometimes they'll just leave some blank spaces in case they want to name somebody else. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'll move on. <laughs> you know, we don't want to miss anybody. We, we, want to, we want to get them all. The ones that make everything and have anything to do with it. So they left these blanks just in case we missed a God. And they were eaten up with idolatry. By the time he writes the letter to the church at Thessalonica, he says in chapter 1 and verse 9, Therefore they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Now, as sure as I'm standing here, he said that they were serving idols and turned from their idols to the true and the living God. As sure as I'm standing here, if there is a true and living God, and there is, we know Him. We that are saved, we know he's, who He's referring to. Not many true and living God. One true and living God. One. Last night I preached about one way. There's only one way to heaven. One God. That's the prayer of the children of Israel. The Lord our God is one. There's one true and living God. But, as sure as there is a true and living God, that means there evidently must be false and dead gods. Now, when God made man, give me just a moment here and use your thought with me. When God made man, man was placed with a desire to worship. Because we are all at our best when we worship God. But the problem is, the instinct to worship sometimes turns man, instead of to the true and living God, to the false and dead God. Now today things have changed. Men don't want to, women don't want to say that they follow idols, or statues, They'll pride themselves in the fact that they don't worship idols. But you know, I find a lot of people, even in the church, they are consumed with idol worship. Every person will serve a God. And the God you serve, you will conform your life in the image of the God you serve. And soon after you serve that God and conform your life into the image of that God, soon you'll want to be surrounded with an environment and a community that has that same image. That's the way that everyone... What means more to you in this world, what you would give anything for, what you could not do without, that is your God. Now... Here's where it gets a little touchy. 
By the time the prophets came along, it had started with false idols, and they called them Baal worship, B-A-A-L. Today, the idols in the church, and I see it happening, people are turning from the true living God to false gods and idols, but we still serve idols, it's just we spell it different. It's not B-A-A-L, it's B-A-L-L. Uh, oh, help me. I, uh, I absolutely despise the fact that Christians can't go through one church service without getting notifications pushed to them about who just got a hit at the ball game and who just got a score. Turn yourself off. knowing if the Reds won or not. I'm not anti-ball, but I am anti-putting anything before God. You can worship the building more than you worship. This is a beautiful building, but I'm here to tell you, I've been in brush harbors that they built with little old wood poles and molded their own block. And they had the power of God there just as much as we have the power of God here. God has blessed us with a beautiful church in our home church. But I want to tell you, He was God before we ever built that building. And He'll be God, glory to God. But that building is all God. If you're not careful, you'll worship the building. You'll worship positions more than you'll worship the true and living God. The title can mean more to you than anything else. I one time walked up to a preacher I was holding a meeting with. And I said, hello, brother. It's good to be able to preach this camp meeting with you. He said, don't call me brother. Call me doctor. <laughs> and he said, aren't you a doctor? I said, I'm not even a good licensed practical nurse. <laughs> I'm not against education. I think it's great to get education. But the thing of it is, I can't worship a degree on the wall. And I can't worship the, the background that I come from. I can't even worship my own parents. I have wonderful parents and they showed me the right way. But my parents can't get me into heaven. I, I can't worship a baptismal certificate. I, I can't worship a creed or a code. We have to turn from idols to share the true and the living God. God. Daniel chapter 3 and verse 1. Here's a false God. If you want to know what a false God consists of, Daniel gives it in one verse. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Let me tell you how you know if you're serving the true and the living God. Here's a false God. If you want to compare something, put the real to the artificial. Now, I'm, I'm diabetic. And I'm just going to tell you, I don't want nothing sugar free. <laughs> and no matter how much you tell me your sugar free cookies are the same as cookies with sugar in them, it's not the same. <laughs> I might look like I come to town and put the bucket, but I can tell the difference. I'm telling you, it's not the same. And when you become diabetic, you want the real stuff. I wish people with sugar would say amen right now. You know what I'm talking about. They're nothing like the real thing. You can tell the difference. Someone said, oh, I mean, that was Splenda. It's wonderful. Splenda is splendid, I suppose. But it's still not sugar. They're nothing like the real thing. And let me say this to you. The living and true God, there's nothing like Him. And if you want to find out who He is, compare Him to what He's not. And here it's simple. Three things He gives us. Number one, Nebuchadnezzar the king, He made an image of gold. If your God was man-made, He's not the true and living God. Man. If your God was made, by hands of man, he's not the true and living God. In fact, you have to believe just the opposite. My God wasn't made, my God made me. Amen. 